Okay, so today we're going to talk about abductive learning. And some of the topics in today's lecture really were the inspiration for wanting to do this course in the first place. Uh, I found it really interesting that this idea of being able to abduce how you can connect logical statements to a perceptual model was, was really intriguing. And of course, knowing my background in abduction, I, I kind of latched onto this. So just a very quick review from our abduction lesson. With an abduction problem, you have a theory, you have an observation, and a set of hypotheses, and your explanation is some subset of those hypotheses that uh, can explain the observations, is consistent with the theory, and also um, uh, minimizes some parsimony requirement, some sort of objective function dealing with the simplicity of the solution. So here's a setup for abductive learning. So we have some underlying logical language and we have a set of domain knowledge B. Okay, some of the papers use KB for knowledge base, some use B. Uh, you know, think of this as a logic program. Typically, it's going to consist of rules in most of this work. You have the training data that you have. The X's are, are vectors. The Y's are ground truth labels. These are kind of the final ground truth that we're trying to determine. Now, there is also an assumed set of primitives that are in the language of B and we don't have any information on those. So we could think of this as we have a bunch of handwritten math problems and we have uh, you know, a ground truth solution, or we have handwritten math problems and we know if they're right or wrong. And the primitives may be something like, you know, uh, what the digits actually are, what the operators actually are. We don't have labels on that, we just know if it's, say, right or wrong, for example. And we do have some perceptual function P that maps features over the hyperspace of the X's to the primitives. Okay, we're going to say that P is maybe some undertrained model, something maybe you downloaded a pre-trained model from Hugging Face or something like this, um, or you had a model that, you know, maybe was trained with a very limited amount of data. Okay, so it's not going to be that great by itself, uh, but it gives you a primitive for some X in that hyperspace. Now, to put this in, you know, the terms of the previous lecture, you know, knowledge base, that's your theory from the Eider Gottlob work. And the samples here, these are your observations. And actually, in the first ABL paper, they have like a section where they say, hey, here's how this maps to normal reduction problem. So the, you know, Regia, Eider, Pool, all those guys, we call that observations. And then this is where things start to depart. Probably the closest thing here in the abduction literature was uh, um, that perceptual model from David Pool, where he had the image of the maps. And so this is sort of like that, but it's directly like the CNN layer used to identify the digits in the SATNET work that was in uh, the first lecture of the course. So the intuition is that the perceptual model is going to ground out uh, samples in that hyperspace into primitives. And in terms of logic, those primitives are now treated as facts once that happens. So if we have perfect perception, uh, you know, we get those facts. And all we have to do is abduce how the primitives connect to the rest of the logical theory, allowing us to conclude the whys. And this delta C is kind of the missing piece of the logic. So we're missing two things. We have a perceptual model that's not that good, and we got to replace it with something else. And we're also missing 
part of the logic program itself, part of B, and that's what delta C is. And they use C because they say at the beginning of the paper, we assume the language about concept C. So that's why they say delta C. And so you could argue that the goal is for all observations in set D, B, union with delta C, and they kind of abuse notation a little bit because they have this P of X returns primitives for all the X's. So they say, well, this gives you kind of a big conjunction of X. All of these things together models uh, each of the ground truth labels. Now, of course, who can see something wrong with this math here? Or maybe not so much wrong, but in practice. Because obviously I want to find something that's going to, for all the samples, this is, you know, these aren't just observations and abduction speak. These are actually machine learning samples. Do you think it's really realistic to be able to model all of them? The complexity is higher. I'm just saying this. You're going to have what? You're going to have noisy data, most likely. So, so that's you're going to have issues with. Observations, theory, All right, so they change the criteria a bit. And they say, hey, you know, you're not going to model all of the observations. You want to model a lot of them, but, you know, realistically, it's not going to make sense to model everything. Some are just going to be bad for one reason or the other. Also, what's interesting here is that is becomes a relaxation of what we talked about in abduction earlier as the covering requirement. The last slide, you're covering everything, but the authors here, they say, hey, let's relax it. So instead of a parsimony requirement, it's they're looking to try to maximize coverage. So they have this thing, con, which is short for consistency, H, and H is defined as the uh, delta C union with the perceptual model. D, which is your uh, data set, and B, which is your ground truth. So they're going to maximize some subset DC, uh, that should be a subset, um, of D. They're going to maximize the cardinality of that such that those are covered by the explanation. All right? So... Here's kind of the basic idea, right? You have the perceptual model. The perceptual model returns all these primitives that now become facts. You take those facts, you add them to the knowledge base, and then you do standard abductive inference to find the delta C. The idea is, is that some of that perceptual information is going to be inaccurate, and we want to figure out a way to use that delta C to then update the labels to the perceptual model. And I'll, I'll get into the details of how they do that in a moment. But for now, let's just take a little leap that somehow that delta C can help us uh, provide new labels, and then we can retrain the perceptual model with better labels. And so, um, you know, a, I'm going to talk a little bit about experiment early here. Uh, the authors, they study this, you know, as I was saying at the beginning, like a binary edition with handwritten uh, digits. And they even did some things where they had like non-standard uh, pictures and coding uh, numbers and stuff like that. And the idea is that, hey, they have some rules about how you can uh, do addition. So if you are combining two numbers together, you've got to do things like carry operations and stuff like that. But how two binary digits are combined to produce a third uh, is left as uh, undefined in the base model. So for example, we want to know if I have two zeros, does that make another zero? If I have a zero and a one, does that make a one? So of course, if it learns I see a one and a zero, and it gives and says then zero, that's obviously you know an inappropriate rule. 
So of course, um, getting to what I was uh, mentioning earlier is we want to update these labels. And in particularly, this is going to be an issue in the early iterations because P is not going to be that good. It hasn't been trained on anything. We don't have any, you know, really good ground truth about these primitives. We're sort of relying on like a ResNet kind of thing to, you know, just get things started. So they introduce this idea of masking. So, okay, if we don't use P at all and we just do abduction, we've totally broken the link between perception and reason. And there's not really much point in that. But what if we just mask some of the results of the perceptual model, the ones that are the worst? And so we're going to say that little delta of P of X, these are the primitives we're going to remove from D. Okay, there's going to be some classes that we're going to say it's just, you know, it's just not doing too well. So we're going to redefine our hypothesis as P of X minus these labels that we're getting rid of, union with this new thing called delta delta P of X. And this is abduced replacement labels. And then, of course, we still have our delta C, which is other parts of the knowledge base that, you know, we haven't determined yet. These are like how you do the addition operations. So these are also abduced, but one way to think about this is, hey, you know, this is the perceptual results. This is, you know, my abduced uh, logic. And the stuff in the middle is really just more abduced logic. We can think of these as rules saying, if the model said this, then maybe we should replace it with this other thing. So because of that, because we can treat these uh, replacement uh, primitives as being as something that can be abduced, the authors are able to throw this in as part of the optimization routine. And they're using a uh, non-differential you know, optimization technique here because we're trying to produce you know, uh, symbolic items as a result. So, on top of that, you want to be careful about how much you're going to mask. And so they have this hyperparameter M, where at any iteration, you're only going to mask, uh, you know, a maximum amount of the primitives. So we're constraining the optimization step that occurs when abduction happens. But again, this is, even though it's normally expensive to add in a constraint like this, the way you know this optimization procedure is working already, it's kind of doing a search over discrete elements. So that's not going to increase uh, the cost of that too much. So how do we retrain the perceptual model? Well, again, we don't have ground truth for the primitives. So we do, an, we do the first iteration and the perceptual model is just giving us like its best guess. Maybe some of the things look like something from the pre-trained model and it gets a small number of them right and it gets a whole bunch of stuff wrong. The abduction procedure is essentially figuring out what are those M worst offenders and it's replacing them with something new. Now the, uh, the reason why the uh, abduction engine could potentially do a good job of that is because it has that background knowledge. So it's going to be replacing those primitives in a way that is more consistent with the background data. So the hope is, is those are going to be a little bit better labels than the last iteration. And so we can take the results of the perceptual model minus the masked primitives unioned with the new primitives coming from the abduction procedure and treat this as the new ground truth going into the neural network training of the next iteration. And so this is a nice little graphic from the paper and kind of gives you an idea. So here is, you know, an image, an MNIST image being perceived, going through the neural network, it's saying it's one, 
And then this optimization routine that says, hey, I'm going to keep that one. Now it has here, this says, you know, this is a MNIST image of a zero. It says this is a one. And then somehow it comes up to the conclusion that, oh, no, that should be revised because it's going to be inconsistent with the remainder of that math problem. Additionally, also notice the abduction routine is also abducing things about mathematical operations uh, as well. And so when it sends all that back up in the ground truth, this is being retrained as uh, zero. So what's happening is that next iteration, you have a much better set of primitives because of the abduction engine saying that. So now you're going into with a better set of primitives and that in turn makes abduction work better because it's working with a better uh, set, of, you know, better set of facts to figure out what rules should be added and also which of the remaining primitives should be masked and replaced. And so you do that over and over, the hope is that you get pretty good results. And so the authors did a bunch of studies with kind of these uh, MNIST and they also had uh, you know, uh, non-standard uh, uh, images representing numbers that they had their own little thing that they say, hey, we're going to say that this is a zero and this is a plus and so forth, uh, just to have an, a test where it wasn't being a slave to things that are, are commonly labeled. And in both cases, you know, in their studies compared with, you know, standard neural approaches and stuff like that, uh, they do obtain uh, good accuracy uh, compared to the baselines. The other interesting thing, though, to look at is uh, what happens with the uh, iterations and then the accuracy, but also how about the CNN accuracy versus the equation accuracy over time? And as you see in the beginning iterations, things are kind of a mess. And they color coded this to show when the resulting knowledge base is inconsistent, even though it's trying to really hard based on the objective function to get something consistent. It can't possibly find a solution in these early phases. And it's basically because the perceptual model is so bad. But the approach does seem to work because you start to see the pink. Uh, dots, which are consistent knowledge base, sneak in there right as this thing turns the corner and the overall accuracy improves. And if you look at the supplemental material for any of the SATNET papers, you actually see some results that, that kind of look like this there as well. So later papers don't focus as much on the delta C and instead, they focus more on the ability to abduce replacement labels. And one thing to keep in mind here is uh, in the abductive learning literature, they're not solving abduction problems to address a real world abduction problem, like solving a, a mystery or something like this, or abducing a fault. They're just using abduction as part of the model training process. So that's kind of the whole mindset of this line of research. So they kind of get away from abducing delta C to, you know, just changing the labels. One of the reasons I think for this, and it doesn't go very deeply discussed in the work, but as we know from the earlier lecture, uh, logic-based abduction is hugely expensive. I mean, the, the whole eider gottlob paper that we had was a bunch of theoretical results that just basically says, uh, says this is very hard to do computationally. These complexity classes I highlighted here, they're all you know, well above NP uh, hardness in the polynomial hierarchy. They're harder than that by, by two or three levels. And so you, know, so you quickly get to the space where you can't do anything practical at all. Now that said, in a lot of this work, they make a lot of um, simplifying assumptions about the logic, about the structure of the logic program. Uh, they don't explicitly call those things out, but they do make that, and it's necessary. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to, to run anything. 
So this gets into the next work uh, that is, I think, uh, quite interesting. It's ABL with new concepts. So we all see these things, these like um, out of distribution detectors, right? And in this paper, they use something really off the shelf from scikit-learn. It's, you know, from some paper like uh, more than a decade old. But using an out of distribution uh, detector by itself is just going to say, hey, you know, your machine learning model is encountering something it hasn't really been trained on. You know, results may vary. Like that's all it's telling you. You don't know what it's getting wrong. You don't know how to correct it. And so the idea is that uh, can we leverage information from an out of distribution detector, which is essentially this uh, additional detector is giving us another hole in our results. Can that be filled in with abduction? And further, going back to the original framework, you have, uh, you know, in your knowledge base, you have rules about some larger concept that are all based on primitives that we know about. Well, what if, uh, you know, if we have new primitives, we can't possibly have any rules. So we have to come up with new rules on how to handle this new thing that the out of distribution detector found. We may even have the case where there's new higher level concepts as well. So here's a, a graphic from that paper. So of course, you know, you the idea is you have your perception and then that's converted into something symbolic in this odd even test, you have some reasoning. But what if you uh, only had digits zero through eight and nine was something new? And so they did experiments along those lines. They had some more interesting experiments as well. And what if we also had a higher level concept of multiples of three? Can we figure out what to do with that? And so th this is sort of where this work is, is heading from. So the setup is very similar uh, to the other paper, but I'm gonna point out some key differences. So here in the data set, one of the values of Y may not appear in the head of a rule in B. So you may that you get in the training data that is not in any is not in your knowledge base. That may occur. The other thing is there is going to be one unknown primitive. So throughout this work, they only are they never do more than one. Uh, new unknown thing. And I think it probably is going to be uh, a bit more involved to go beyond one. And then you have the knowledge base. And again, the knowledge base doesn't have any rules that have this unknown primitive because we haven't seen it. Before. It's being seen the first time by the out of distribution detector. So in this work, you know, it's this is about like a uh, year old paper, maybe a little less. They're basically saying, hey, if there is a hole in perception, you know, how can we fill that hole using this domain knowledge and using abduction uh, to complete the picture? So they had a, a nice overarching algorithm. So I use that as a way to sort of walk through what they're doing. So the first thing is, uh, you know, on the very first iteration, when the perceptual model is run, they also launch the out of distribution detector and they only use it on the first iteration. And it's just basically is saying, hey, we're gonna call this label new. If the out of distribution detector says you should pay attention and we're just gonna return the perceptual model result otherwise. Then what they're doing is now that we have a new logical symbol that comes from the out of distribution detector, uh, can we learn rules to figure out what to do with that? So they, this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting thing and I believe it relates back to complexity because note that they're actually using induction to add rules to the knowledge base as opposed to abduction as the earlier paper. And I believe this is the case uh, mainly due to reasons of complexity. Uh, because they 
Uh, one thing about introducing a rule, especially if you look at the supplemental of the first paper, there's essentially abducing these very compact facts that says something like add, you know, zero comma zero comma zero. And that fact is essentially a rule that says if you have zero added to zero, you get another zero. So they're abducing these very small atomic things. In this paper, to understand the context of a new concept, you need a, a rule that's a little bit beefier that has a rule body. And you might not even know the length of that rule body. And my guess is that putting that as part of the abductive task uh, probably made things a little bit more difficult. The other thing, too, is I'll mention a little later, just very briefly, they did have a follow on work where they did this thing called uh, abduction by similarity that I, uh, was shown to be a bit faster than the original uh, optimization routine. So anyway, they're learning these rules with this um, ILP solver that's uh, based in uh, ASP, answer set programming. So then what they say, well, some of these new rules, they may conflict with the existing knowledge base, so they need to do some corrections. And this conflict resolution is actually quite simple. Um, so they say, hey, if I have this new class, and we see things are divisible by three, and I have a class of even things divisible by two. Well, what if my numbers that I'm dealing with are sixes that are divisible by both? And so we want multiples of three, in this case, to be separate from even and odd. Well, the solution is very simple. Basically, they're just adding, tacking on the negation of the new rule to the old rule and vice versa. And so by adding that there, if this is also divisible, if this is x1 is divisible by three, I negate that, and that never causes this rule to fire. So that's a very simple solution they came up with. So then we move on to the abduction step, and this z bar is the new primitives being abduced. And again, there's no delta C this time. And finally, they're updating uh, the perceptual model. And note here that the new primitives, they're baked in at this point. So we had the results of the out of distribution detector. It gave a bunch of things with uh, you know, the label new. Those are treated as facts and abduction to this thing. Now, on that first iteration, those uh, probably all that happened with those new labels from the out of distribution detector, they probably didn't get replaced. And here's why because they identified those labels uh, with the out of distribution detector. And then they learned a bunch of rules that use those new labels to conclude things in the knowledge base. And then they went back and abduced corrections to the primitives. Well, clearly those new rules, especially since they don't conflict with anything, there's no reason to change the labels of the new things. Uh, but the other stuff, you know, there, there likely is. So then this is a really interesting part of the paper. They go and they take the rules that after the whole thing's done, you have your final set of rules, all the iterations, they take a common sense knowledge base and they see if they can align the rules for the new stuff with the knowledge base to actually provide a real uh, definition. And you know, when I was putting these, together these slides, it made me think of what Jerry was talking about back when we did symbol grounding, where if you see a logic program like this, it's not really helping anyone, right? No one. No one knows what role 541.83 on constant IND 7136 and so forth. Like, that's meaningless. It's kind of like if you've done any cybersecurity work, if you run IDA Pro and decompile code, you get things kind of like that. And you have to you know, figure out what is that function really doing. So here's how they go and align these new rules that have this concept new that's meaningless to a human being 
with a knowledge base. So they, they take a, a common sense knowledge graph called ConceptNet, and they note that in these knowledge graphs, things are uh, created as triples, and triples, you know, have a, a strong linkage to rules. The people who do work in knowledge graphs, they talk a lot about graph hopping, and that's because you might have relationships like, you know, um, you know, teacher uh, lectures at class, which you have that graphical relationship, but you can come up with a rule that if X is a teacher, then he's present in a class or something like that. So what they did is they first they identify a subgraph of the knowledge graph that is relevant to the problem based on the presence of things in the uh, uh, knowledge base using the abduction problem. And then they create an embedding model. And then the new rules are then turned into triples that create the new, just but just for the rules that have the symbol new. And so based on the embedding model, they look to score every candidate for what that missing symbol could be. So if we say ERT is a triple resembling a rule, and R and T were known bits of that rule, and E is your new concept, well, we want to look through all the possible E's to see which one we can uh, substitute into there that maximize the likelihood of that relationship existing in the knowledge graph based on the embedding. So that's the strategy they use. So here's an example. Uh, they had a chess experiment and they said diagonal move B1, V2, uh, item P is new and attack, you know, V1, V2 with piece P. And so they have new, used for, moving diagonally. And so the knowledge graph was able to conclude the new aligned with, with Bishop. So why is this interesting from a symbol grounding perspective? Well, you know, like I said, the outlier detector can find a new primitive, but it doesn't know what it's good for. ILP can then you know, put that into context and allow us to have a rule around what that new thing from the out of distribution detector is potentially used for in the domain. Now, ABL then takes it to the next step and ensures that those new rules are consistent with the rest of the knowledge base. And as we go and we do abductive learning, really the whole thing that's going on there is you're really forcing consistency between perception and reasoning. That's the bottom line with that. So you have, you find the new thing, you figure out its con the context of the new thing, and you put that, mix that context with everything else and make sure stuff is consistent. And so this is the final step, but notice it's using the rules that were learned with the ILP, but you needed the out of distribution detector to do it. And you wanted to have those rules be in the context of everything else so they don't conflict with the other stuff. So you needed all this, all these pieces to then finally provide a definition to this new symbol. And that's, I think, what's probably most compelling about this particular work because it's making a really uh, good attempt at, you know, taking something that's new, putting it in context, and saying, this is what I think that is. So here's some of the experiments, and I thought these were more interesting than in the last paper. So the first one is, you know, that everyone has to have this MNIST experiment, so less than with new digits, chess with new pieces, and multiples of three. So baselines, um, they did a, a standard, so in all baselines, they still use the knowledge base. So with the standard CNN baseline, this is kind of the first thing that would come to someone's mind if they were throwing this problem. It's like, hey, you know, use a CNN to learn uh, labels for these items and then use 
uh, rules that you run right after you know uh, the CNN runs. Then they did the CNN with having a new class detector, the original version of ABL from the last paper and ABLNC. And of course, only ABLNC could align the results with the knowledge graph because it's the only one that's both doing outlier detection and learning new rules. So what you see, they, they separate their uh, results between perception and reasoning. So perception primarily dealing with the primitives, reasoning dealing with the final outcome. Uh, what's interesting to note here is uh, ABL without the new concept detector, it's still uh, doing pretty well in terms of both perception and reasoning. And even that is outperforming the baselines without new concept detection. And it's probably because ABL is doing a better job of kind of, you know, managing the consistency between the logic and the uh, primitives. So even if it's getting a primitive totally wrong, it's putting it, you know, it's something that makes some kind of sense. But that's not happening in either of the straight machine learning approaches. So the less than with new digits. So they say the digit that was masked was, was eight. And with, if any of you have uh, taken the class last year or watched my uh, differentiable ILP lecture, you probably saw a bunch of uh, predicates that look like this for successor, where uh, X or you know, Y is a successor of X. This is used in these kind of numeric problems. So ILP in this case was uh, able to learn X and new X is seven, Y is new, then X is succeeded by Y. And same thing with going from new to number nine. So it really learned that it was an eight. And because these are numbers, it was pretty easy to align this with concept net, and that alignment was successful as well. So chess with new pieces was interesting. So, uh, you know, this is a little more sophisticated because what you have essentially is configurations of chess pieces on a board. And if there's an attack relationship between two pieces, then the sample is labeled as such. Um, these are images, so they're received. And, you know, as the epochs went on, you know, the rules around what all the pieces uh, did, uh, well, the, well, the rules around the new pieces, rather, start to evolve. But the uh, bad part about this one is it wasn't able to match all the concepts with the knowledge base. And the authors found that the conversion from rules to triples was a big point of sensitivity in this. And so if they had new used for moving in a straight line, it would get, it would get the wrong answer. But then the following one, new used for moving in direction, uh, it would align it. I think this was with like a rook or something. So, uh, I think the issue this also highlights is the importance of the ontology of the base knowledge base has to use the same symbols as uh, the knowledge graph for this to be successful. And you also have to know, you know, probably some details about the semantics of what these things mean in the knowledge graph as well. Multiples of three was the only experiment where they had a new label Y. And so the results of this uh, were, you know, more noticeably different on the reasoning level than the other two. And actually, let me just go back real quick to point that out. So if you look at all the other ones, reasoning, you know, even CNN with outlier detector still gets 0.9 accuracy. Uh, reasoning both CNNs are getting, you know, high 80s, low 90s in terms of accuracy. You get to multiples of three, 
The only thing that's getting above 90 is ABL with new concepts. The others are, are doing very poorly. So the biggest thing that was shown here is that the rule learning piece, I think, was, was effective because the only way you could account for these new higher level concepts was learning new rules about them. In some ways, you can think of this as sort of a hack on their original approach because in many ways, you know, if you remove the new concept part, it's the same problem formulation as the original abduction paper, except now they've replaced, instead of abducing delta C, they're learning these rules. But it seems to be effective. And also here, they were successfully able to align it with concept net. Now, one thing they had kind of, uh, you know, uh, buried in the experimental part is they said, well, you know, the initial perception model was trained in 5% of the MNIST images in a supervised manner. So, okay, um, you know, be that as it may, that kind of makes me think is like, how sensitive is this to that initial perceptual model? And then how do we, you know, how do we deal with this if we have less information about perception? Some other limitations uh, that I think are kind of present here is one is that they're only doing this with a single new concept or a new primitive. Uh, the scalability of the whole optimization procedure, as well as the complexity of these, you know, is, is just not studied and they didn't provide those results. Um, the complexity of ILP also could easily be something that precludes scalability. And if, again, if you look at some of the ILP work, like that stuff can get really bad really fast, especially if you start getting into noisy data. How are the perception models bootstrapped? And of course, you know, the, the coup de grace for all of logic. Where does the knowledge base come from? Now, interestingly, though, uh, these last two points uh, are, are both somewhat addressed in, in follow-on work. So let's talk about that. So addressing the limits of initialization. So, you know, how much are we relying on that model to be good? And the other thing is, it's not just the labels themselves, but it's going, the confidence scores associated with those labels, those scores are going to be way off, particularly in the early iterations. And, uh, you know, for those of you who do work with me, you know that it's a big issue, the confidence scoring of uh, samples from a machine learning model. It can, it can easily be way off. So anyway, uh, this strategy, they aren't relying on labels, but more something that is uh, getting into kind of the um, non-parametric space. So the idea here is to use a similarity score to guide a beam search optimization to identify the primitives. So essentially looking at uh, the uh, interclass and interclass distance uh, between samples. And they're replacing the abduction process with this. You know, part of the reason they get away with it is again, they're, they've kind of ditched this let's abduce delta C and focus just on updating labels. And by doing that, they can take this more non-parametric approach, combine it with uh, a greedy beam search, and they say that's gaining a lot more efficiency. So they did this uh, experiment where they had uh, CIFAR encoded digits. So, you know, which is, kind of funny, you have a car being one, an airplane being two, and to see if without having any kind of existing labels on the primitives in the model, so it's just giving a, a you know, I think of maybe ResNet or something like that, uh, you know, what's it going to do with them based on how it clusters them? And so they did some tests where they looked at uh, ABL with uh, similarity, and they also looked at 
uh, this uh, kind of turquoise line. This is ABL, but the uh, model was pre-trained on the CIFAR images representing digits, which that's kind of like, uh, you know, the sort of like the Oracle, right? This is the one you want to beat. And then they also looked at just, you know, some standard ABL stuff as well. So the new approach actually uh, is on par with the pre-trained model, which is actually pretty impressive. So the other limitation here is where does B come from? And there's been some very recent work on this. And the idea here is, can we extract B from a knowledge graph? And so I kind of like that they uh, took this direction because it's as if, you know, the issues they had with aligning the rules of the knowledge graph kind of shed some light on a lot of uh, trouble in going from, you know, knowledge graphs uh, to logic programs. And I think that's really important because, you know, um, I think there's kind of assumptions in both uh, the knowledge graph and the logic community that there is like, you know, hey, if I have a big enough graph, I can, you know, I have a great knowledge graph and I can, I can create a huge logic program, but none of these logic guys have the computational power to handle it. And meanwhile, the logic guys who do a lot of math say, hey, I have this great theorem. And yeah, yeah, someday we can take a knowledge graph and, and make all this stuff work. Uh, since these guys actually attempted it, you know, it, they go into a bunch of issues where, you know, hey, you know, first, the knowledge graph is really large, but maybe you can just nug down a subset that's relevant to your particular problem. But then we got to get the knowledge graph to align with the concepts in the problem we're solving. And we also have to account for noise and inconsistencies in the, the knowledge graph. So one example they gave in the paper is uh, the use of the word animal. So if I have a cat, we could have a rule that says, if cat, then it's an animal. But if we're talking about like animals in the zoo, then in that context, cat's not an animal anymore. It's, it's a distinct class. So they go through a procedure here where they take the knowledge graph, they find task relevant subset of it, and then they, they do, uh, you know, they do this uh, thing with uh, having a signature of the resulting rules. And they define a signature as all the predicates in that logic program. And they manipulate that to extract the logic program then to use in their uh, target abduction problem. So anyway, uh, I think this is like a really interesting line of work. I think there's a lot of promising results. Um, and next lesson, we'll talk about uh, a couple different approaches to applying constraints to uh, perceptual models, but all of those approaches have much more of a deductive feel. All of those approaches deal with, hey, I have my perceptual layers and I'm tacking some logic on top of it, maybe as additional layers, maybe as a loss function, but I'm putting that on and then that's improving results. Now, many of those things are highly effective. And I think a lot of them are more scalable than what's been presented in ABL. Uh, but, you know, this is providing a, a bit different uh, mindset to the approach. So, of course, I've been talking about that a lot. And so the recent work, such as this Ipskite paper, they move toward more practical settings. Still, the majority of the empirical results are, you know, our favorite data set. So um, I think some of the things here need to be addressed before, you know, it can kind of, you know, move beyond these toy problems. And I think even the knowledge graph stuff is still a bit far from real world application at this point. So anyway, uh, that concludes the lecture.